scripture text comes from Genesis chapter 48, verses 8 through 22. I, I encourage you to follow along as I read. And I remind you that this is God's holy word. It is inspired, inerrant, and infallible. And it says to us this morning, When Israel saw Joseph's son, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh at his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw what his father laid his, hand, his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's hand. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great." Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them all, blessed them that day, saying, Be you Israel, by you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die. But God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. May God bless the reading of his word. We had a wonderful weekend last weekend but in the process I think someone passed on a bug to me so I've been struggling some others of you as well all week with this thing <clears throat> I think I'm on the way out but I'm also not doing more than I have to sparing my voice so uh, we're going to have a bit of a shorter sermon I expect that may make some of you happy perhaps I don't know and maybe a quieter sermon too. But my friend Jim Whittle said, you know, Delosier at half strength is like everyone else at full strength. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, thank you, Jeff, for reading that. <clears throat> Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you that in our weakness, you are strong. We thank you that <clears throat> our weakness is the opportunity to uh, show forth the, the glory and strength of Christ and the power of the gospel and the wisdom of our God. For we are sinners saved by grace alone. And you are the faithful one. It's not by our strength that we prevail. It's not by our wisdom that we are known to you. For we are weak and sinful and wretched we are prone to wander, but you, O oh Lord God, are good. You are faithful and you are true. You are the good shepherd, O oh Jesus, and we love you because you first 
loved us. Thank you for your word and feed us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we saw last time, if you remember, it's been, I don't know, two, three weeks, that Joseph came rather quickly to his father's side when he heard the news that his father was in his last hours, perhaps days. And he brought with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And in verse 8, it appears as though uh, this is the first time that Jacob notices that these boys, well, they're actually now grown men, were there in the room with them, that Joseph didn't come alone. But we're also told that Jacob was by this time very, you know, really at the end of his life, that he uh, was nearly blind. Um, perhaps he had macular degeneration or glaucoma or some eye disease that wasn't quite as treatable or curable as it is today. And so Jacob asked his son Joseph, who are these? It's quite a beautiful scene here. Joseph was able to introduce his sons to his father and uh, their, his father to the, his father's grandsons. And we can imagine this scene, the family gathered together. Uh, we are told how the Hunt family uh, had been gathered together in Gene's last days and weeks and, and even minutes, this beautiful family scene, singing hymns as Gene passed into glory. And Jacob was not yet quite to that point, but again, it's, a, it's quite a lovely scene. And notice uh, Joseph's fatherly pride. He says, they are my sons. As Jacob asked, who are these? They are my sons whom God has given me here. But the meeting here is really much more significant than this mere introduction and the expression of a father's pride in his sons. Because he points out, notice, that his sons were born where? Here, in Egypt. Now, Jacob obviously knew that because he was a young man when he left, a single man, and here he has a wife and, and two sons. So perhaps Joseph is letting his father know that God has made him fruitful in all these years of his exile, away from his family, apart from his own will, forced into exile by his brothers, yet God had given him gifts. God, was, uh, God had made him fruitful, even as he had named Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And we see that a lot of healing has happened in Joseph's heart. As he had received many good gifts over these two plus decades, God had been gracious to him and kind and poured out many gifts, not the least of which was, of course, his family, his wife, and, and these two boys. And so indeed, in his bitterness... God had given him a taste of sweetness. And in his darkness, God had given him a ray of life, light. You know, we also live in this world of vanity. And we experience it as well. You know, the discouragement of this vanity. You, you, you pull weeds from your garden only to have them grow back again. Uh, grass doesn't seem to grow often, but weeds do. You, know, you bathe the kids, if you still have young kids, and they seem to get dirty a few minutes later. Or you wash your car, repair your car, and it gets dirty or breaks down again. And then there's that unrelenting wrongdoing we experience as we are sinners interacting with other sinners, and it just always seems to be a mess most of the time, right? And yet, in the land of our affliction, because that's where we are now living, believers, in the land of our affliction, Christ is the light that shines in our darkness. Isn't that what the prophet Isaiah said? Um, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Christ is the light that enters into this dark world and brings sweetness to our bitterness. We can taste that sweetness in this sour world. He is with us to give us gifts, gifts of his father's love poured out upon his children 
whom he loves. So the first lesson, there's only going to be two this morning in this shorter message, maybe more devotional. The first lesson is God is faithful. Know that. God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his children. And notice that Jacob said to Joseph, bring them to me. Bring your sons. Bring my grandsons to me, please, that I may bless them. And here we get to the crux of the matter. Because these weren't just Joseph's sons. These weren't just Jacob's grandsons. They were children of the covenant. They were children of the promise. In verse 47, remember that Jacob had uh, insisted that Joseph promised to bury him in the place where his fathers were buried. Jacob was away from that place. He was now in Egypt. He knew he wouldn't go back, or at least he didn't expect that. And he said, you must promise to bury me in that field which was purchased by my fathers as a burial place. And that was a sign that his descendants would inherit that land, the land that God promised long ago to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob himself. And so that's because these were children of the promise. Remember, God had said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your children after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I will be your God, and I will be their God too. And so the sons of Joseph would also share in that inheritance promised to Abraham. And notice how Jacob is called Israel in this passage. That was his covenant name that he was given many years ago. And it was, it's the reason why God's people were called Israel. And so when Israel kissed these boys and blessed these boys, it signified God's covenant love for them. Because Jacob, here he is, the, the heir of the promise, right? When he embraced them, it's as if God himself was embracing these sons, these now grown men, and kissing them. And he said to his son, I never expected to see your face. And now God has let me see your offspring as well. Your offspring, your seed. Again, it's that covenant language. The heirs of the covenant, the next generation. God has let me see them as well, along with my other sons. Again, think about it. Manasseh and Ephraim were children born of an Egyptian woman born in Egypt. But they were Joseph's sons. And therefore, they were part of the covenant community. They were part of Israel. They were part of the family of Abraham. And they also were heirs of of the promise. This entire passage that Jeff read, it's all covenant language. I hope you can hear it there. It's just so plain. It's covenant language, Jacob's blessing and the language he uses. He's letting his son Joseph know that God will be faithful. They're off in Egypt in a foreign land, but God will be faithful to his promises. God will bring them back to the land he promised. We know now that it's going to be a long, long, long time. I don't think he, well, he did tell them that back in Genesis 15. He doesn't tell them here, perhaps for good reason, right? You're going to come back about 400 years from now. But God will bring you back because his covenant is an everlasting covenant to be God, to Abraham, and to his offspring. Beloved, I want to tell you that God still 
sets apart families. It's always been that way. From, from the very beginning, God created what? A family. Adam and Eve and gave to them children. They were God's people. They were the church. They were God's people in God's place, the Garden of Eden. And think about Noah. Noah was faithful. Noah found favor. But who was saved in that ark? Noah's family was saved in that ark. Of course, that becomes clear in the covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And now also under the new covenant, the church is not comprised of random men and women. I can look out here right now and what do I see? Families, for the most part. Some of you are single. But families, for the most part. God still calls families to himself. And this is why Paul in 1 Corinthians refers to children of believers, or even one believer, as holy, okay? Sanctified, set apart. Our children, the children of believers, are set apart in a special relation to God, and they receive the sign of that relationship, which is, of course, baptism. It's not to say that all children of believers are saved as children or even shall be saved ever. The Bible doesn't promise that necessarily. And baptism doesn't guarantee that. What it shows forth is that God sets apart families. The family is holy. God sets it apart as his people. As in the old, so in the new. There's continuity. And so the children of, the male children of Abraham were circumcised, not because they said, I want to be circumcised, but because they were the children of Abraham. That's why they were set apart. And so in the new as well, they are set apart because they are children of believers. And as the children of Israel were to trust in God for forgiveness of sin, so our children are called by that sign and by that being set apart to trust in that God by expressing their faith, their repentance, their hope in Christ alone. Because in their baptism, they bear the sign of God's covenant and promise. Keep in mind, you must always understand this, and people get confused about this. Baptism is a sign of God's covenant to us. To us. It's a confirmation of his promise. It's not a confirmation of what we do. And praise God for that because we are very uncertain. You know, we, we don't want confirmation of what we do. It's a confirmation of God's promise. And so I learned that long time ago from I sat, I was blessed to sit under the teaching of Dr. Sinclair Ferguson with his Scottish brogue, and that was a real blessing. And he would say that it's a, contram it's a, it's a sign to faith, not of faith. It's from God to you to say, and I will be faithful. It's not a promise of anything we have done or will do. And thank God for that because he is the faithful one. He is the unchanging one. He is the steadfast one. One author wrote it this, put it this way, the circumcision of children in the Old Testament was never thus a testimony about a person's choice of the Lord to be their God. It wasn't about their choice. It was always an act of wondering faith on the part of the parent that the Lord was willing to be the God of their children also, isn't that beautiful? And there is not any new, I challenge you right now, there is no New Testament teaching that I've ever find, found that removes the children from the covenant and reckons them as strangers or outsiders, as Gentiles, as it were. Find it for me. I have not found it. Keep in mind that in Genesis 17, the Lord made it clear, I've read this to you already, 
that his covenant involved Abraham and his offspring as what? As an everlasting covenant. How long is an everlasting covenant? It's kind of a long time, isn't it? And so an everlasting covenant does not cease without either one clear fulfillment or specific abrogation in the New Testament. You find neither of those, right? Not in the New Testament. In fact, there's every indication that the continuity of the covenant of grace necessarily means that the children of believers are still included in the covenant of grace. And that's why as you read through the book of Acts, recording the early history of the church, what is normative, normative household baptisms? They happen time and time and time again. And I've often wondered, why aren't household baptisms normative in our churches today, even Presbyterian churches? Because God is still dealing with households. Barbara knows and will remember that uh, in California in particular, I was blessed to practice household baptisms. In fact, I kind of uh, semi-seriously claim to have the OPC record of household baptisms. Because one Sunday, Barbara will remember, right? I baptized nine children. One family on one Sunday. That was a wonderful thing. A household baptism. God is faithful to our children. Don't ever doubt that. Second point is we can trust that the God who has shepherded us will shepherd our children also. When Jacob laid his hands on Manasseh and Ephraim, he imparted to Joseph and his sons, the blessing of the covenant, that they also would receive that promised inheritance in the promised land. In Jacob's words in verses 15 and 16, and they're really beautiful, beautiful words. Notice there's the reference to the past and the present and the future, the past the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, looking back to God's faithfulness. Remember, actually, he was one time sort of moaning and complaining, you know, all these things have been bad. He has a different perspective now, a more mature perspective. God has been my shepherd. God has been faithful. The angel, even referring to the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the boys. Okay. G Jacob's reciting God's past faithfulness and imploring its continuance. In fact, he knows it will continue. He is asking, may the blessings I have received as God has shepherded me and my family, may those blessings. Redemptive blessings continue on in my children, and in particular in these two boys. And isn't that every parent's prayer? Those of you who still have children at home, those of you who have grown children, who perhaps are wandering, who have not yet come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing, looking back, I can look back to 37 years of marriage with Barbara, and then even before that as a believer, four decades of God's faithfulness to me. It's amazing. It's staggering. Through all the ups and downs and crazy twists and turns of life, God has shepherded us through all those days. And we believe that he will shepherd our Children, his character is unchanging. Don't give up, dear ones, because I know some of your children are wandering, not all of ours. 
are true to the Lord right now. Don't give up on God. Keep praying. Keep believing. He is faithful. And then he references the present also. He says, in them, let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. John Calvin explains the meaning of this. He says, this is a mark of the adoption before mentioned, for he puts his name upon them that they may obtain a place among the patriarchs. Indeed, the Hebrew phrase signifies nothing else than to be reckoned among the family of Jacob. So by being identified with the names of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, may they have nothing less than those same blessings God has already bestowed upon the fathers. And then there's the future. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, or probably better, into a midst of the land. Again, there's that promise of land. You remember the, the, the phrase fruitful and numerous. May God bring about through them that which he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will do it, though it becomes clear it's not exactly as Joseph anticipated, just like uh, Jacob and Esau, right? The younger will be greater than the older. Regardless, our God is faithful. Our God is a true shepherd. I borrow from John Piper, our God is the God of future grace. Again, notice in verse 21, God will be with you. God will bring you into the land. Jacob was about to die. He knew that his time was near. And he knew that he himself would not return to that land where his fathers were buried. Though he would return, his body would return where he would be buried, but not in his living days. But he understood that God had made a promise and God's promise was certain. And he was exhorting Joseph to also trust in the certainty of God's promise. Will you do that? Will you do that for yourself? Will you do that for your children? Will you trust that God is a true shepherd, that he is faithful? I mean, again, think about it. Does your life not testify that Jesus is your good shepherd? That Jesus is your true shepherd? It does. Can't you say with David, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and has followed me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is why the psalmist also wrote, he is not, I love this, this verse, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. I have to confess, when earlier this year, when I had follow-up appointments, uh, I had certain tests were done, and I had to go back to the follow-up appointments, and they'd always check your vitals, and they'd check my blood pressure, and it was high. And they'd say, you have high blood pressure. I was like, geez, no kidding. I'm sitting here waiting to hear if I got cancer or not. I don't know, high blood pressure was checked yesterday. It was 112 over 60-something or other. But I was afraid of bad news. I shouldn't have been, but I was. But when we're trusting in the Lord, we're not afraid of the future because God's already there. God is our faithful shepherd. He will keep us and hold us. So here's what I've seen. I think here's what you've seen. Life is indeed evil and vain. Who can dispute that? Unless you just haven't been around very long. But yet our faithful shape shepherd will redeem all of the evil we experience in this life as he works out all things together for our good. So Paul said this, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus his redemption makes that certain. What he has started, 
he will begin. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So let me close by the words of a commentator who sums it up really well. That means that all of the evil circumstances in your life right now, the sins that others are committing against you or the sins you have committed that are now bearing bitter fruit or those out of control aspects of your life that are so painful are under his sovereign control and will not be wasted. Yes, they really are evil. You don't have to pretend that these events are something other than that. We live in an evil and broken world. However, as the cross and the resurrection of Jesus demonstrate, we serve a God who, <clears throat> who regularly brings glorious light out of the deepest darkness, beautiful good out of the ugliest evil, perfect healing out of painful sickness, and resurrection life out of death itself. This is the faithful shepherding God who has committed himself to lead you until the day of your death and then welcome you into a glorious inheritance in Christ in which all of the evil of your life will be beautifully and wonderfully redeemed. This is your God, beloved. Amen. Thank you, O God, for Jesus who has done this work in reconciling us and bringing about these rich blessings, the fruition of the good news in our lives. And we can trust you forever and ever. We can entrust our children, our grandchildren, for you are good. You have made promises and you are true. Lord, let us not be afraid of the future. Let us not be afraid of bad news. Let our heart be firm, trusting in you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.